Hello! In this video I'll be sculpting and painting an Aegir Huntress. It's a character I've designed for my world building project, Heroes of the Ravaged Gardens. In the Ravaged Gardens, the Aegir are one of the three main factions, alongside the fanatic Marakians and the Emnic Knights. In this video I'll talk a little bit about them, as well as how I went about designing the Huntress. Alright, so I have talked about this faction before, in this old video, of the making of an Aegir Queen. At that time I hadn't really decided what the world was going to be like, and there are parts of that video that no longer fits with the setting and that need to be changed. That said, some things still hold true, like the religion that gives them their name, and the fact that they are a semi-nomadic people that travel through the wild forest between settlements every few years. I like the overall visuals too, with lots of fabric that both stand in contrast to the armored warriors of the other factions, and hint about Aegir's skill in producing linen, cotton and the like. In the 1500s, in Europe, not on Morn, clothes with slashing were fashionable. I've been running around the internet, trying to find the definitive answer to why, without success. But in any case, it seems obvious that it's in part to display your wealth. I figured Aegir, with their direct access to fabrics, would use a similar style to show off. At the same time, this character is a hunter, and would be sneaking about in the dense forests. Big bulky pants with holes or folds in them would surely snag on everything. So hunters and other woods people instead wear slimmer hoses on their legs, but with short breeches covering their crotch. With slashing to show off, but also making them easier to move about in. Another typical attribute of Aegir clothing I've kept from the old sculpture is the coin lappet. A piece of leather hanging from their belt to which they sew their coins or other pieces of precious metals. The huntress is not very wealthy, so she has only a small lappet. And she can't have exposed coins rattling and reflecting sunlight when moving around the forest so hers has a flap to cover them as well. The shoes still take inspiration from what I've been calling Iron Age shoes, which is a pretty loose term, but I also did some research while making this video and found that they are not too different from these shoes. These shoes are 5500 years old and literally the oldest leather footwear that archaeologists have found. I'm debating with myself whether it makes sense for the Aegir to use shoes like this, while shoes of much more modern designs with heels and hard soles are common among the other two factions. In the anti column is whether it makes sense for the people that walks the most to have the worst shoes, and it gives the impression that the Aegir wouldn't have the technology to make the other type, which isn't true. In the pro column we have cost. They are cheap to make, which is good if you walk a lot and wear them out constantly, and practicality. They might not need a modern type as they don't walk on hard stone as much as the others that live in cities or mountains. Let me know what you think. If you've seen any of my previous fantasy sculptures, you know I'll never pass the opportunity to add a few belts and buckles. In this case they hold a drop down knife sheet on her leg. She also has a harness for her belt. Well needed as we'll be hanging a bunch of stuff from it. Number 1. A bow holster. I think holsters for bows are really cool and not seen often enough in media, so of course she gets one of those. Number 2. A quiver. Goes without saying really. And number 3. A sword. I've started to diversify and split up among them the types of weapons the different factions use. The old Aegir Queen sculpture has a long sword, but moving on that will be mostly seen in Amnicans and with Marakians every now and then. The Aegir uses curved single-edged swords. They would have evolved from scythes or machete-like tools used to clear ways through the forest. In terms of real-life inspiration for the Huntress's sword, it's a mix between a katana and a Burmese da or thai daub. These are really cool swords that I've never heard of until recently. I've been thinking about making something like it, for real, in full scale. Let me know if that's something you'd be interested in seeing. In the meantime, I'm just gonna finish up sculpting these hands.
Sculpting the head was the usual ordeal. After a couple of attempts I had something decent, but after sculpting the hair I thought the forehead looked too big. So I removed the hair and whittled it down. In the end I don't really know if it made a difference, but I'm okay with it. Then I made a hood. And I attached all her accessories to the belt, with some additional straps and buckles. Lastly, I glued the horns to the headpiece. And the sculpting is done. So far I have only used the airbrush for coloring in big sections, but I want to use it a bit more. So I made a stencil to get this rhombic pattern on the pants. The test piece worked well, and so did the first couple of rhombi on the legs. Every now and then I messed up. But that could easily be cleaned with a wet cotton swab. So I'm giving this method a pass. The sword had fallen off. So I took the opportunity to add a very simple but nice and effective plural pattern to the scabbard, just as the old figure had. After that I only had two fiddly things left to do. The striped fletching on the arrows. And the eyes. My god, I must have done this four or five or six times. At least it was easy to remove the paint from the ball bearing eyeballs to retry. It is worth spending time on it, as messed up eyes can ruin the whole impression of the sculpture. This attempt wasn't even the final one. Ah, oh, anyway, that's the figure done, and we can move on to the base. I started by putting her on a nice round base that I cut from a piece of plywood. I originally planned to have a tree behind her with some game hanging from it. I have this idea for a kind of deer with a wreath of horn growing from the jaw. 
but I couldn't get it to look good even after multiple attempts. So I scrapped that plan and instead decided to chop the tree down to a stump. I went to town on it with a Dremel to make it look old and rotten. Nine times out of ten, my bases are very flat and boring, and I think it's about time we changed that. I cut out the XPS foam with a hot wire cutter and a knife, and made a small hill. Nothing extreme, but good enough to spark some visual interest. I used wood filler to fill the gaps and add texture, and I mixed some dirt goop to simulate dirt. A sprinkling of bark looks like leaves and debris. And now it's time to introduce the static grass applicator. That looks amazing. So much better than sprinkling it on by hand. Now I just need to paint the edge and add some goopy moss. And we can have a look at the finished piece. Alright, that's it. Thank you for watching, I hope you liked it. I'm always curious to hear what you think, be it good or bad. I have the next couple of sculptures planned out, but if there's anything in particular you would like to see from my world building project, please let me know. Take care. Bye!